Good morning. As some of you are probably tired of hearing me saying because you come every week, I'm the Dean of University College and I'm pleased to welcome you today, this being the fourth of four talks on the theme of memory, which are held under the auspices of the University College Master of Liberal Arts program. Our aim in the Master of Liberal Arts speaker series is to provide our audience with opportunities to hear and discuss topics of general interest. Sorry, I'm making noise down there. From a variety of critical disciplinary perspectives. That approach is the hallmark of the MLA program. And I hope that through these lectures, maybe some of you will become interested in pursuing an MLA degree. Also, because many people here who attend these lectures are already involved in or have expressed an interest in becoming involved in the Lifelong Learning Institute, I want to invite you to the Lifelong Learning Open House on March 25th from 12 to 3 p.m. at our West Campus location on Jackson Avenue, lifelong learning being an important aspect of University College. Lifelong learning involves, as some of you know, peer-led classes and now has, amazingly, nearly a thousand members. We're having an open house because we've just joined forces with the Osher Foundation, which sponsors more than 120 lifelong learning groups around the U.S. and which has given us an important multi-million dollar grant that allows us to expand and improve our West Campus lifelong learning facilities. I think if you enjoy these MLA talks, you'll certainly enjoy engaging with lifelong learning. Finally, I've been asked to announce that there will be another memory-related event at 2 p.m. on April 28th at the St. Louis Public Library. And that is a talk given by Dr. Heidi Koch, now assistant professor in the Sam Fox School, and formerly one of our instructors in American Culture Studies. Her talk is titled, Taking Possession, the Politics of Memory at the Campbell House. Information about that talk, the MLA program, the Lifelong Learning Institute, and my own personal phone number can be found in the lobby outside. Um, our speaker today, I'm happy to say, is a distinguished member of various departments, Pascal Boyer, professor of sociocultural anthropology and psychology, and Henry Luz, professor of individual and collective memory. Professor Boyer is the author of five books, including Traditions as Truth and Community, A Cognitive Theory of Traditional Discourse, the Naturalness of Religious Ideas, and the widely cited book, Religion Explained, The Evolutionary Origins of Religious Thought, which, by the way, has been translated into, by my latest count, 10 languages, as well as very many articles on these and related topics. In 2011, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, and he's received five other important fellowships as well. The title of Professor Boyer's talk today is How Memory Creates Traditions. Please welcome Pascal Boyer. Thank you much. Uh, thanks a lot for coming today. Uh, today I'll talk about something that seems to be absolutely obvious and turns out to be less than totally obvious, which is that we need memory in order to have traditions. So I will give you an example from an African tradition that I studied uh, many years ago, and also I will try to relate that to examples of traditions that we uh, are more familiar with. So let me start with these sort of general questions uh, about what traditions are and tr what traditions are not. Um, so what we mean by traditions in, in anthropology is, is, is mostly the similarity in representations in people's minds across individuals and across time. 
and these are supported by communication events. So, for example, if you have blue eyes because your parents had blue eyes, that's not a tradition because that was not communicated through social interaction. Um, but if you have certain ways of thinking and ways of speaking or ways of, uh, of viewing the world, uh, that may be because others communicated with you. So all these things are the vast um, domain of tradition. And traditions could be very small and they could be very large. I'll give you examples. But before we get that, we have to um, think a bit more clearly about what traditions are not. And the one thing that traditions are not is the past. Uh, traditions are often represented as what came from the past, but they don't have to be the past. And um, also, uh, conversely, lots of anthropologists or social scientists would tend to think that when we think about traditions, what we're talking about is manipulation of the past. You know, people tell you that we should do things in a particular way because we always used to do that, but it's because of their interests. They want to have certain social orders, um, and that's not entirely true either. So it's not a cons pure conservation of the past that is preserved, and it's not pure uh, invention of uh, an imagined past either. So it's something in between, and I want to give you some examples of that. Now, the, there are traditions of all shapes. Uh, there are traditions that are very small population and are very short, and I'm sure you uh, many of you are familiar with these things like uh, family words, family expressions that you know, are transmitted in a particular family, and only this family knows those words or use those words. An example of that is a wonderful book by the Italian writer, Natalia Ginsburg, that's called Family Lexicon. That's all about this um, uh, uh, phenomenon. It only has five users over two generations, so it's very, very small tradition. Uh, these are the users, uh, Natalia Ginsburg, her father, who was uh, famous in the Italian resistance to uh, fascism. They had those little words that the father had invented that were a kind of mixture of Yiddish, German, and Italian, and they all spoke, you know, they all used quite a few of those words. But that's a very small tradition, very few people, and very short duration. There can be a very small population in a tradition, but a very long uh, chain of transmission. So. Uh, for example, consider something that's, uh, <laughs> there are many other examples of that, but here's an example, harpsichord playing, and in the French tradition, mm. uh, French, German uh, and, uh, 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 tradition, which has certain style of ornamentation that was invented in the 15th and 16th century, uh, this, um, these things have been transmitted by dozens or hundreds of people, not more than that, over many, many years, decades, uh, uh, four or five centuries, from Francois Couperin, who is one of the inventors of modern on ornamentation and harpsichord playing, and this cool guy who is uh, Scott Ross, who is an American harpsichord player who died recently. Um, so between these two individuals, at each point in time, you only have maybe a hundred people in the world who actually know how to do this thing, and they transmit it to the next generation of players. Now, conversely, you can have uh, traditions with a very large population and long persistence, and that's the case of religious traditions, for example, which uh, can be, be they sort of, you know, very popular things like uh, witchcraft beliefs or uh, holy um, uh, transmission of holy scripture and ritual or sort of strange rituals. I don't want to trigger you, so I will move on to the next. Oh, sorry, you're not students, so I can trigger as much as I want. Uh, <laughs> This is good. <laughs> so you also have traditions that we don't usually think of as traditions, which are uh, phenomena of transmission over uh, a very large population for a very small, uh, for a very short period. And fashion, of course, is one of them, um, uh, like miniskirts or sort of strange fashions in modern Japan. Uh, this is 18th century, or yes late 18th century France, or this kind of thing. <laughs> um, it's clear that in, or it is clear, or one may hope, that in 20 years, people will think, find all these things equally ridiculous, but uh, they tend to uh, carry on. So we do have uh, fashion, and it's cultural transmission, and it's a tradition. Uh, these are signals. Uh, these things are signals. Um, I put the Star Trek or Star Wars Star Trek, I think, Star Trek, uh, people here because I, I, want, I just wanted to emphasize that we do have traditions, and this is a picture of, 
a word that people inv uh, invented and they thought there would be no tradition, so everyone is dressed more or less the same um, in the future. That's not never going to happen. People want to have a style. They want to have a style that's different between men and women. They want to have a style that's different from the previous generation or that's very much like the generation before that. In other words, people are interested in these traditions. They're not, uh, they're not likely to abandon any of these things. All right, so, uh, well, here's another uh, kind of tradition that's more exotic but is becoming more familiar to us, which is changing the body. Uh, there are fashions and traditions about these things. Some last for a long time, some of them are very recent but very widespread. Um, this is, yeah, like this fellow. Um, this is more or less where we're going uh, by present trends. Um, so, or modifying the body in more sort of dramatic ways. Uh, these are things that have been done in lots of different cultures, and uh, in all these cultures, uh, they are either transmitted as fashions, that is, large transmission for a short time, or as long, uh, persistent traditions for a long time. Um, now, do traditions require memory? Yes and no. Um, in, in an obvious sense, they require that we store something in our mind, that's obvious. But it not, it's not absolutely clear that they require memory in the sense of um, having a whole sort of set of texts or instructions in our minds. Um, and the point that uh, anthropologists would make about this is that, yes, tradition exists, traditions exist, but collective memory does not. Um, collective memory in the sense of a whole society remembering is not something that exists because it's metaphorical, it's, it's really confusing. What happens is that as um, other anthropologists of the um, beginning of the 20th century pointed out, like Gabriel Todd, what we have is individual transmission from person to person and lots of aggregation, that is accumulation, accretion of content that produces those traditions. However, there was something um, that um, in Gabriel Todd where he was wrong, which is that uh, we tend to think that traditions are, um, are um, transmitted by imitation. And that is slightly um, um, that is slightly misleading, and I try to explain why it's misleading. But before that, I want to give you an example of a tradition, one that I've um, uh, worked on. There is the tradition of what's called med vet ekang, which means, uh, which doesn't mean anything else than vet ekang. It's a sort of proper name for the tradition of poet singers who use this instrument called mvet and uh, recite very long epic stories over uh, an entire night, usually. Uh, these stories can take six, eight, uh, nine hours, um, and are extraordinarily complex. I will try to sum up one of those stories uh, actually told by this fellow, um, Akuo Biang, and, um, and you'll see some of the flavor of this. And uh, I want to illustrate to the, the point about tradition by using this example because it's interesting in terms of memorization. Now, the, the, the reason why I went to uh, do field work on these um, epics was in, in part because of this challenge that how can you memorize, oh sorry, how can you remember extraordinarily long stories, extremely complex stories like that uh, in a culture that is that doesn't use literacy and most of these singers and the, the fellow here are illiterate, uh, do not take notes, do not have a book, uh, so they have to have all this stuff in their minds. We now know that, of course, they don't have literally the entire story in their mind. minds. It's kind of recomposed as they go, but uh, there are some um, features of this that are interesting for more general examples of tradition. So all this happens in um, the K South Cameroon and uh, Equatorial Guinea. That's where I did my field work. If you're uh, a bit vague about wha where those places are, there are here in uh, between the Congo Republic, Gabon, and uh, Cameroon. Uh, if you're a bit vague about where that is, this is where it is. <laughs> and if you're a bit vague about what that is, it's here. <laughs> All right. This was the part for the students, okay. Yeah. Okay, so what happens in these things? Well, in a MVET session, uh, and I emphasize the fact that the, the tradition is the MVET session. It's not the text, it's not the music, it's not the, the singer, it's the combination of all these things. 
So in a vet session, what you have is a public recitation that's always taking place at night uh, with lots of um, uh, visitors and a whole village. And often uh, it's done during a funeral for some, uh, and this will be relevant, you'll see why. And it's a social occasion, you know, people drink, dance, uh, sing. Uh, it can last 10 hours, as I said. And it's not just a narrative, it's not just um, uh, someone uh, talking, but there's musical interludes. Uh, the instrumentists sometimes try to um, impress the audience with his virtuosity or uh, get them to, um, to sing, um, and so on and so forth. Also drumming demonstrations and all that. I will give you um, a very short example, if the electronics follow me, um, of what this sounds like. So this is the guy talking. Uh, I'm, I'm showing this example because it shows the various registers. Here he's just explaining part of the story. Okay, this was a bit loud, but uh, sorry about that. Um, so, what happens during these um, uh, these sessions is that there are two kinds of two main kinds of narrative elements. One is a sort of uh, a set of stories, uh, stories about some uh, extraordinary characters, um, and another one is uh, lyric poetry. Uh, the the singer telling us about him, himself, and what his uh, connection is to his tradition. So what are the narrative elements? You'll see these are really interesting stories, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that these things are not translated um, into English because many of them are extremely good. So basically there are always two tribes, and one of them is called Engong and the other one Oku, and uh, the, there are some recurrent characters that everyone knows, uh, like Akumamba, the taller and stronger than an elephant, uh, Angolin Dong, who's as mean as a hippo. And if you've lived there, you know that a hippo can be a very, very mean creature. Um, and Kudong Domo, who's so beautiful that men just faint when they see her, and she's all knees and breasts. <laughs> um, other characters on the other side, uh, like Dong Mitze, uh, uh, who is, yes, uh, and the ghosts. Uh, the ghosts are a very important character, uh, or sort of members of these things. So here's an example. Uh, there's always a recurrent, the, the recurrent theme in all these epics is that the Angong people have the secret of immortality, and the Okui people, who are mortals, are trying to steal that secret from them by making an alliance with ghosts in order to steal this secret. And there are then lots of battles and lots of love stories and things like that. And then, of course, the mortals fail because the ghosts, the ancestors, agree that it's normal that people should die. Uh, so they will not have the medicine of immortality. So here's an example. Uh, this is an, uh, a story that was sung by this um, very, very distinguished um, vet singer called Nzungim, um, which starts with one of the mortal uh, heroes being absolutely furious because he's just realized that other people in other village are bold enough to breathe some air that he could be breathing instead. So he summons all his warriors and says, we have to go to that village. And, um, and someone tells him that they have the secret of immortality. So he says, well, we will get that from them. And they all get on their flying iron elephants. Um, and they start to uh, try and uh, attack the other village by throwing rainbows at them. So this is the kind of uh, stuff that happens in those stories constantly. It's a sort of mixture between uh, fantasy, uh, fiction, science fiction, and uh, traditional sort of um, Homeric kind of uh, fights that you get. Um, this is another picture of someone 
um, reciting them that. So now the chief of Ingong is outraged that he could be attacked like that. Um, gathers his many wives and children. Uh, he puts them all into a small bowl that he makes very, very small and puts that in his nostril. Then rides this gigantic iron parrot and goes to uh, see the uh, ghosts and try to get, to get help from them. Um, then he starts by uncompressing or decompressing his family, by uh, you know, uh, getting them out of his nose. And uh, so there are lots of, you know, uh, comic fantasy kind of um, 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 in, uh, examples in these things, and orders them to prepare his war costume that will supposedly scare the other people so much. But um, an Akuma, uh, Akumamba um, attacks, sorry, attacks Oki, I made a mistake here, uh, by spitting red, red hot iron balls at them. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that happens. Uh, then, the Zongmidzi, who's the, on the case on the side of the mortals, asks for the ghosts' help. Uh, they give him what they call an armor, which is not a real armor, but it's they turn his rib cage into an iron uh, rib cage, and they place a beehive inside it, uh, so that the bees can attack his enemies. Uh, in the meantime, there's always in the meantime. You know, you can't have a story that goes on for eight hours without having in the meantime something happening, because otherwise, you know, you'd run out of. Of stories, there's Ngudong, the, the terrifying beauty who seduces, uh, who's from the immortal village, seduces someone from the uh, mortal's village. So we have a kind of Romeo and Juliet situation here. Um, and again, you know, you have the bees coming out of his chest, and, um, and they're metallic bees, they're made of metal. The theme of iron metal is absolutely uh, uh, constant in these epics. Uh, so the ghosts seem to favor the mortals. Uh, they, they give them extraordinary weapons, they tell them where the enemy is, but th then the ghosts get tired. They don't want to do that um, anymore because the mortals are too arrogant. Uh, because in Kudang, the woman who's um, there is constantly creating lots of uh, problems by being so incredibly be beautiful that men forget why they're there. And also because the mortals do not pay their debts, and that's, that means that they do not uh, they're not respectful enough of ancestors and ghosts. So the ghosts you know, um, end up by betraying um, Okri. They make the warriors crazy, um, and they use the, the buzz of the iron bees to make them so uh, uh, crazy that they forget to fight. So that's the end. So um, a story like this is usually uh, um, told in a sort of um, environment that, that, that um, I, I should describe a tiny bit because it matters. Uh, Fang villages are sort of uh, construed by people as oases of uh, culture uh, surrounded by the jungle, that is by savagery, by the non-culture, by nature, by also ghosts, spirits, and all sorts of very bad uh, and, um, and dangerous creatures. Uh, people have uh, their village and the center of the village is a sort of uh, open space. They have their gardens right behind their houses and they do not really like uh, the rest of the uh, forest because they find it dangerous. Uh, this is a more modern sort of uh, version from when I was doing field work there. Um, uh, this is a very old illustration. This is the at the end of each village, at the end of this um, open space, there's a special um, space for uh, where usually men uh, congregate during the day and uh, gossip and do very little else. In, um, yeah, because they've finished work on their plantations, so um, the women go and, and uh, make some food and the men just gossip and wave, uh, weave baskets and gossip. Um, but this is also the place where, um, where those um, vet uh, recitations take place. Now, there is something that makes these recitations extremely interesting for people and intriguing, but also kind of upsetting sometimes, uh, which is that there is a sort of uh, this uh, a sort of a, a connection between what the poet is saying about himself and what he's saying about the the mythic heroes, and that's why we have these two main registers: you have the lyric poetry, and you have the epic narrative. So the lyric poetry is mostly about the, the poet talking about himself and saying that he's exhausted 
Um, he's weary because he's harassed by young women who want him. Uh, he's harassed by his admirers. I mean, none of these things is true, of course. Okay, that's just a sort of. I there are swarms of young women who want to uh, pursue him, like bees out of a, uh, a hive, and so on and so forth. Um, but the two major themes in that lyric poetry um, is the ghosts. Uh, they know me, they pursue me, they will catch me. Uh, this is uh, ghosts are the spirits of dead people who are around in a village. Um, and another uh, theme that comes uh, very often is, I am not the singer. I am the singer for the, for the ghosts. Uh, the vet is singing through my voice. I am not the person who's singing. So the, the, the session talks constantly about those ghosts, those uh, what are called big hong, which are uh, the, 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 the souls of recently deceased people. And there are some that are real for people, that is, they, th they know that there are ghosts around, and there are people, and there are ghosts of a fictional kind that are in the epic poetry. So let's talk about the real ones. Uh, you may have seen these um, masks from the Fang region, which are uh, very uh, well known in Western, Western art and in Western museums, and are now extremely valuable. Um, the the Bekong are the souls of dead people. Um, they can be encountered in dreams. They're usually not visible, but they haunt uh, gardens around the, the village uh, and plantations. They're jealous of the living, uh, so they're a bit dangerous. Uh, they're not yet ancestors, um, so people become ancestors once they've been given a second funeral uh, several years after their first funeral, and in between these two places, these two events, uh, souls are wandering around and generally uh, making mischief. They bring about illness, misfortune, things like that. This is another um, of these um, fung uh, masks, which has this um, broken uh, part um, right in the middle. This cleave, cleavage, so to speak, is. Um, a sign that the, 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 the person who's represented here was an initiate, so he could receive uh, knowledge from the ancestors through his forehead. And ghosts matter because uh, people think they're responsible for most things, that uh, bad things that happen to them. So in a village like that, if someone falls ill, if there's an accident, if there's a series of accidents, and so on and so forth, uh, people think that it must be because of the ghosts. And another very important point here is that um, the only way to deal with the ghosts is to have someone, I, here I call him a shaman, that's not technically in the, in the right term, but that's someone who's a healer, who has a, s a special relationship to those, um, to those um, uh, um, uh, ghosts because he's made a pact with them. Um, and people like that are supposed to have different organs from normal people. They have an extra organ, um, and some of them are told uh, said they have a cloven forehead, um, in metaphorical terms, of course. But the idea is that these people who can interact with the ghosts have made a pact with them, which means they've given them something in order to get a special talent or a special skill. That could be the skill to heal people, it could be the skill to sing epics, but the idea is that you've paid for this. And there is a sort of, and no one says what you've paid for it because there's a kind of a, a rather sinister um, point there. So this is another uh, Fang mask that's uh, representing the Bekong. They're all white, uh, they're very pale, um, and they come back to haunt people. This is an, a representation of proper ancestors, that is, once they've become proper ancestors. And this is, uh, uh, well, okay, the, the, these Fong masks have had, um, there's a tradition in Cubist painting that got very inspired by them. So the, 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 the singers are talking about these ghosts, which are real for people, that is, they are around, they are threatening, they're something that we know exists, but there's also the fictional ghosts that are in the story, and no one confuses them. However, this, the, 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 what makes this recitation really interesting for people is that at some point it becomes impossible to tell which is fiction and which is a real statement about the ghosts. So, for example, the stories about the ghosts, 
Uh, they're pivotal characters in the stories. Uh, they're the only characters in those stories that have a realistic description, that is, they correspond to, someone, to something that people know from their everyday life. Um, and the poetry, the lyrical songs, are also about ghosts that are pursuing the singer for a reason that is never explained. You know, why are the ghosts after me? Um, now, the thing is that in order to understand why the ghosts are pursuing the singer, you have to pay attention to the narrative. And the narrative says that the ghosts are after someone when that someone got something from them but didn't pay for it or didn't pay enough. And the, 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 the idea is that uh, for any skill that is exceptional like that in this kind of society, uh, you have to have paid maybe with the life of a, of a relative, the life of a child, or something like that. And the idea that the, the singer is trying to convey without ever saying that is that he may have paid, but he didn't pay enough, and that's why the ghosts are pursuing him. So that's the sort of thing that um, in that kind of village, you never talk about. You know, When I say that people are familiar with the idea of ghosts and things like that, these are not things you talk about. These are things that you whisper about to people that you really know and you're intimate with, but you do not make public statements about these matters, because by making public mat uh, statements about these matters, you would betray that you know these things. And knowing these things means that you're engaged yourself in the kind of activities that the uh, ghosts are engaged in, that is, killing people, making them sick, and so on and so forth. So you don't want to be, for example, it when you, uh, a healer says, I can heal you from this, they're very careful to say constantly that um, they didn't get this medicine by being criminal uh, in any way, um, and no one believes that, because everyone believes that they got this skill by giving away the life of a relative. So the singer is trying to do that without doing it, to suggest through the fiction that he is uh, knowledgeable about what the ghosts do, uh, but also uh, say that he's not really responsible. And there's a sort of recursion that keeps uh, going on that, you know, the singer is a remarkable individual and in, this, in that society, anyone who's remarkable is at least uh, suspected of having something to do with witchcraft and the uh, ghosts. But in the fiction, it says, well, if you are given something by the ghosts, you must have given something. But hang on, that was in the fiction. So as a singer, I didn't say it. You know, I just told you uh, that it happened. The singer constantly says that he had to pay for his music, uh, that it's eating his bone, his soul, etc. What he's trying to say is that I did not give enough, and that's why they make me suffer. Some pale strangers are chasing me. Uh, which means, you know, ghosts, because ghosts are white. Um, and payment means witchcraft. Okay, so all these sort of uh, intricacies of talking about something without trying to talk, without really claiming that you're talking about it, is, I think, uh, one of the ways in which this kind of event uh, becomes Ex extremely important for people. They see that it's something important. They can't quite place exactly why that is important. Well, lots of people would say, well, we drink a lot and we sing a lot and it's fun. But at the same time, lots of other, other people will say, yes, but there's more to it than this. It's all, about, uh, it's all about mysteries and it's about things that are important. But what does it say exactly? It's impossible to say because of this uh, recursion where uh, the, the singer is telling you things and then immediately saying, well, but that was fiction. And when it's fiction, it's actually serious about what he's uh, doing. So another uh, reason why, so that is one reason why those sessions are a tradition in the sense that once you've been through these sessions, uh, it's like going through a sort of mental uh, snare. You know, you're trapped. You have to have another session to understand what the previous one was about. Um, and actually, that's a trick that the, 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 the vet singers use very often, which is that uh, they, they say, for example, I'm not going to give my best uh, epic tonight. I'm, not I'm just going to give you a little song for an hour or two because I see you invited me. And he goes on and little by little uh, sings for about eight hours. And then at some point picks up a quarrel with someone and says, well, that's it. I'm leaving and leaves. And of course, everyone says, oh, it would have been so good if we'd had the real story. 
and not this little one. Uh, but of course, that's the only story he ever does. So that's the yeah, that's a trick to make people sort of think that there's more to it than uh, meets the eye. But there is more than meets the, the eye. So there's another uh, aspect um, that makes the um, um, uh, the sto these stories work, which is that they're about something which we find in lots of human uh, cultures, lots of traditions, which is uh, some attention-grabbing elements, particularly uh, notions like ghosts uh, ca that have counterintuitive physics in a way. You know, they go through uh, physical things. They and in the, the case of them, that they do physically uh, um, surprising things, like you know, uh, making elephants fly or turning someone's uh, rib cage into a beehive, but that's mixed with something else. All these extraordinary and counterintuitive um, uh, things are mixed with something that is very, very um, common, which is uh, the, uh, the 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 description of their uh, minds and their motivations is. Uh, incredibly intuitive. We know once we are described, uh, when the, the, the poet describes these uh, people and what they do, we know what how they work, so to speak, mentally. Uh, so, for example, we find it uh, rather funny that someone should be outraged that other people dare breathe. Uh, however, if there is such a person, then we understand what he's going to do and why he wants to fight them. And once he wants to fight them, we understand why he wants to have his, all his equipment and so on and so forth. So his mental properties are not very uh, surprising, but the, the physics of it is very surprising. And also what's attention grabbing here is the weird position of the singer who poses as an expert of something by constantly denying that he has any knowledge of it. Um, so uh, that is something that creates a sort of snare for thought, you know, it's a sort of trap where once you start thinking about it, it's very difficult to get out of it. And these are very general, there are very general properties there, and this is something I've studied for a long time, which is that uh, if you describe uh, um, an agent person that has counterintuitive physical properties, like go through walls or be in several places at the same time, but also has mental properties that are very much the ones we expect from every in everyday interaction, then you have something that is an optimum for memory, uh, in the sense that ca uh, fantastic characters that are uh, described like that uh, are, are remembered better than all sorts of other possible oddities that we could invent. I used to do this work, and for, for many years I did what some people uh, called, uh, made fun of by saying that it was experimental theology, uh, by trying to produce all sorts of uh, new religious uh, concepts that would be uh, just as odd or as counterintuitive or as extreme as the ones we encounter in uh, actual religious tradition and test people's memory. And it turns out that there is a sort of optimum, a sweet spot, uh, when we have um, this combination of uh, physical counterintuitive properties and mental properties that are completely uh, transparent and intuitive. Oh, uh, I won't talk about this. So uh, <laughs> there's too many complexities. And if I was... Um, and my problem here is that I could go on for three or four hours about the vet, but it would become exactly like a vet, except there's no singing, there's no <laughs> dancing, there's no drinks, you know, so... Yeah, it could have been better. <laughs> and I will leave in a huff <laughs> very, very soon. There is a general point here, which is that uh, culture doesn't really transmit, is not really transmitted just by imitation or mostly, uh, or not mostly by imitation, but mostly by inference. What I mean by that is that we have this picture of uh, tradition <laughs> being something like this, you know, you, you, you see this and you see something and you do it. However, it's not as clear as that because the problem is that imitation rarely actually occurs uh, if we define it very uh, precisely in human communication. So. Um, and the problem is that if you think that uh, culture is transmitted by imitation, then what is being imitated? So, for example, here it strikes us immediately that he imitated this little guy, I suppose. Uh, he imitates the big guy's sort of um, uh, posture. 
However, he could have Im imitated the way their feet moved or, you know, the way their, their, their heads were looking at the ground. He could have imitated any sort of things, and he chose one. And, of course, we immediately see that one as imitated, but there are many other aspects of behavior that are not imitated. So it creates this problem that in order to say that we imitate to transmit culture, you have to uh, understand why we select certain aspects of imitation. And it's true that there are um, uh, that there are some aspects of culture that are transmitted by imitation, uh, but some are not. So, for example, give me uh, I give you an example of one that is uh, perhaps transmitted by um, imitation. If you speak to um, oh, if you go to Spain, for example, you'll see people talking at about four inches from each other, incredibly loud. Okay, and you'll think they must be arguing. No, they're having a friendly conversation. Okay, so this kind of distance that for Americans would be very uncomfortable is quite natural for Spaniards. Um, in the same way, uh, when I was doing in uh, fieldwork in Africa, I had this problem that no one would, uh, you know, look me in the eyes and 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 stare at me because that's sa that's supposed to be an extremely aggressive uh, thing. If you stare at someone, you're really angry. So people were talking at my sternum. And I kept going like this and like this, and, and they would keep sort of going because, you know, I couldn't see why they wouldn't uh, sustain eye contact. They couldn't see why I wanted to uh, be aggressed. So, of course, after a week or two, you use you get used to that. But the thing is that these are things that surely uh, we do because we see the others do them, and so on and so forth. But there are much more complex things, like for example, um, if you are a devout Christian. Uh, it's probably not out of imitating the words or the actions of people that you actually saw, but it's by inferring from these words and thoughts all sorts of ideas about what God is and how he uh, can be connected to us and our uh, behavior. And this is something that you probably never observed. If you're uh, a conservative, uh, it's because you heard lots of, it's probably because you heard lots of conservative people talking about various things, but you mostly, uh, either y you may be a conservative or a liberal, uh, you rarely repeat verbatim what other conservatives or liberal said. I mean, some people do, but uh, you know, you, you can go on, uh, um, you can create more thoughts, you can infer more thoughts out of this sort of worldview that you got. But the worldview was not given as a set of principles and proposition, you inferred this worldview from what you heard from other people. So imitation is a bit uh, poor. Um, uh, and in culture in general, what we think in the um, um, study of cultural transmission, we think that there are attractors. What we mean by that is really in the physical sense, in the sense that uh, there, there is a conceptual space. You, know, you could have all sorts of possible notions of, for example, uh, weird um, religious notions. But there are some that keep coming back. Okay. And even when you have distortion in transmission, those things keep coming back. So, for example, the concept of ghosts, which are found in so many human cultures, are things that are found in um, very much the same way in different cultures. And the idea here is that uh, why those things are so frequent come back and will be um, reinvented in lots of cultures, well, it's probably because of the makeup of our minds. You know, we have uh, uh, a human mind that has certain specific capacities and, 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 and preferences, and because of that, there are concepts that are attention-grabbing and concepts that give us lots of inferential power. We can conclude lots of things from them, and there are concepts that mix the two in an optimum way, and these will be likely to be very uh, easily culturally transmitted. So um, what I want to, to, to end with is that you can have cultural transmission without uh, collective memory, but before that, I want to show you something. Oh, if the, if the electronics cooperate with me, which is rarely the case. Um, So far, so good. Uh, voilà. I wanted to show you something that uh, is transmitted by imitation, and you may find 
uh, funny. Um, what is this? Oh, no, 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 no. This is, <laughs> no. they're all equally incomprehensible, so that, that, that wouldn't be there. This is it. You will recognize your own dialect. Is there? And you were looking for somebody that talks like a Mena. I have a strong Miami accent. I'm from Oatana, Minnesota. And I'm a native Washingtonian. Alabama. New York. New York. Uh, Blum Road, Texas. Los Angeles. Oakland. Albuquerque. Philadelphia. Indiana. Hollingwall, Tennessee. I've lived in the Chicago area the entire 49 years of my life. Okay. So what, what is, is your generic, generic term, term for a sweet carbonated, carbonated beverage? beverage? Uh, uh, what? That's the soda. Soda. <laughs> As if it had more. Pop. Coke. Um, Coke. What do you call the long sandwich that contains cold cut lettuce and so on? Hebra? Yeah, uh, hoagie. A hoagie, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I call it the subway. I, I generic, I just do that. Oh, that's a po' boy down here. <laughs> uh, a pecan is a nut. Uh, pecan. Well, in New York, down. it used to be pecan, but in Florida, it's pecan. Okay, I say pecan. 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 Um, can you say this word, B-A-G? Bag. Bag. B-A-G. Bag. <laughs> okay, I say it wrong. Bag. Most most people in Minnesota do. <laughs> oh, yeah. A roly poly. A pill bug. Uh, oh, doodle bug. Little creatures that roll up. I don't okay. know what we're talking about. What? It goes on and on. It's, re it's really funny, but this is the sort of uh, cultural um, material that, of course, um, seems to be um, transmitted through imitation in the sense that it's very difficult not to say bag if everyone is saying bag around you. Um, and that's what, uh, uh, we, but even in this case, which is, uh, sounds to be like real imitation, you know, you say bag, I say bag, and you know, I say uh, tomato actually, because that's the correct way to say it. But, uh, <laughs> and yes, it's imitation. At the same time, why is it so good? It's so good because children are equipped with the specialized system in order to imitate the phonology of their peers especially, but their parents as well when they acquire language. Now, it's not clear that we have such systems for the rest of culture, okay? We don't have a specialized system to acquire the uh, religion of our culture. And that's why I think in that case, it's not tradition, it's not imitation that does it, but it's the kind of um, attention the work of attention that I described in the case of um, of, um, of the Mvet that do the work of uh, creating traditions. So uh, it's not a question of cultural collective memory uh, because that doesn't predict anything. It's more a question of what are the uh, specific mental systems that are activated in particular domains of tradition uh, that make them um, um, that, that, that ensure their transmission from generation to generation. So I think even when we have imita imitation, imitation is not just imitation. Uh, in the case of the MVET, we see that it's absolutely not imitation. In the case of language, it looks like it, but actually it's imitation based on a system that's exactly, that's designed to produce that. So uh, there is no such thing as imitating your culture, but there's such a thing as acquiring it, and that's very different. So that's it, thank you. Questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm interested in classes that are storytelling. How is storytelling become storytelling? Is it a tradition? Yes, <laughs> yes. Or is it hereditary? In this case, no, 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 no. Um, um, as I said, the skill of a storyteller is very, storyteller, sorry, is very, very uh, close to that of people who deal with um, ghosts and things like that. Uh, so basically what happens is that these people start as apprentices with another master, but then that's not enough. Uh, what happens then is that typically they fall ill at some point, and they're cured by someone who says, well, um, and then something happens that they don't want to talk about. So, and 
why do they not want to talk about it, about it is probably because there's nothing to say. Uh, but it's a very good thing to keep a mystery about, which is how did how did I um, how did I move from being just someone who can play the music and knows a few stories to someone who's the real thing? Uh, I will not comment on that. Um, that suggests a lot. I think much more than than than, than actually takes place. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 these people go from one place to another. And actually, usually in their own village, no one is a prophet in their village, as people say, you know. And, and that's the, the thing is that um, in their village, usually people find this sort of double, you know, uh, double entendre and things about, you know, I'm with a ghost, but I'm not really with a ghost. They find that a bit too close to the bone. Uh, so they don't, so usually those people do not sing in their own village um, because it's it's kind of, a bit annoying. <laughs> yes, sir. In this particular culture, you repeatedly emphasize sp uh, spirits and ghosts. Yeah. And even though you mention religion, one thing you never mention is are gods. Mm. Are there no gods in this culture? No. Oh, there's the Christian God. Uh, and the Christian God is is um, um, is um, not really involved in people's lives. That's the so uh, people do like. Um, my village had a Protestant mission, and uh, some of my villages had Protestant missions, and others Catholic um, little parishes. Um, people go to these things. They think they they're serious. They sometimes pray to God, but at the same time, when it comes to um, there is something that they think the Christian God is not involved in. It's uh, producing misfortune. And misfortune is the, the real sort of, um, that's where they, 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 there is real sort of religious activity around those spirits and, 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 and ancestors. And, and witchcraft is the big uh, theme there. So there's a kind of distinction between sort of official religion, which is, um, which people are sincere about, but they don't think will affect uh, the, 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 the everyday lives. Um. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yes. Inference. Uh, right. So that's um, that aspect of um, it's one of those stories where people. Uh, get very excited for a while about a certain phenomenon. So people discovered um, mirror neurons in in um, in, um, in macaques first. Uh, that is neurons that react to gestures being performed by another um, agent in the same way as you know as the agent doing it. Uh, there is there is a lot of circuitry for for uh, motor imitation, and in fact, it's true that for the um, so then uh, people realize that motor um, mirror neurons do not do as much as we do, as we thought. Uh, in humans, it seems that the circuitry is much more complicated. But even in humans, there are um, uh, there is circuitry that produces motor imitation. And the, so that, for example, when you see someone doing something like this, uh, there's a little bit of your brain that's actually activating all the muscles to do this, but then there's another circuitry that stops that so that you don't go around imitating people. Um, unless you have particular pathologies, and, and, or you, you are very young children, and very young children sometimes cannot help, you know, if you do this and they, they go like this. Uh, and uh, people say, well, it's because their frontal lobes are not myelinated yet, so they don't have enough to sort of inhibition to sort of stop this movement before it's, it's engaged. So yes, there is a lot of that going on, but that happens at a very low level of um, uh, activity. So for example, gestures and things like that. And that's why it's probably the case that people imitate things like posture, uh, gait, um, uh, or even sort of, uh, yes, gestures, um, um, uh, or the social distance, as I said, that may be s um, um, supported by that, ki that kind of circuitry. But for more complex bits of culture, it's probably um, um, not the way it's transmitted. 
there was something else that I, uh, but I forgot about, about this. Yeah. They want you to walk, <laughs> that's the thing. They're doing it on purpose. <laughs> I believe you mentioned that uh, the storytelling occurs at sometimes at funerals. Yes. Is, that is there any connection with the oh yes, yes, yes. Is there, Do they personalize the stories in any way? No. To connect them? Uh, no, no, but there's a general sense because the, um, uh, what I meant by funerals was the first funerals, that is someone is buried um, and, you know, shortly after death. And um, at that point, um, uh, the reason why it's kind of relevant is that at that point people know that this person is probably going to hang around in the form of a, uh, a, a ghost for several years maybe. And, and, and that's why stories about ghosts, you know, they don't have to, to push the point. Everyone knows that. Uh, and, and I think that's why this sort of trick of talking about it without talking about it is particularly uh, powerful because people are thinking about these things in that particular event. Um, funerals are very sort of um, joyful things. Um, I mean, some people are sad, but you know, each funeral has you know, 200 people coming and they're mostly having uh, dancing, drinking and stuff like that. And, and, uh, but everyone is thinking about this possibility that this person is now in that sort of s liminal world between real ancestors and real human beings, and people are un uncomfortable with that. So that's why it's, it's, um, it's really about, it's really relevant that it's in those circumstances. But it's not only there, it could be just because people want to have fun, so they invite a, a singer. I said they do it on purpose. live day to day are they involved in how do they exist what is their how, how do you mean find everything they need to live on are they connected to any kind of modern oh yes 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 uh, yes I mean actually when I described this it seemed like these people were sort of in another world but uh, no no they're in villages and um, uh, most of them now have roads and stuff like that and people have plantations and and um, and um, cultivate cocoa and coffee um, cocoa, which many people in the sort of very, um, it's kind of interesting that, that in some very remote uh, villages, people depend on cocoa quite a lot. Um, it's a lot of work to produce cocoa and it's a source of, of cash. Uh, and some of those people sort of, s they also know chocolate from, you know, going to the s towns and buying some chocolate from the market. But lots of people will not believe that the only point of cocoa is to make chocolate because it's candy for kids. And, you know, some people come all the way from Europe and bring planes and trucks and boats to get the cocoa just to make candy for kids. Mm. There must be more than that. Uh, so, but in, in general, and coffee now, uh, all these things are changing very rapidly because the um, coffee and... Um, Cocoa markets are sort of uh, all over the place uh, and have been for several years, so uh, for decades. So uh, that means that lots of people now are migrating to the cities. And some of the vet that I described here has been now transformed into a sort of modern vet tradition that has electric guitars. Um, but people are singing the, 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 the old stories, they're a bit simpler. Uh, but I was really happy to see, I mean, happy th 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 that those guys are seen as kind of bad boys and, you know, s probably connected to witchcraft in a way and things like that. So there's some aspect of the tradition that, you know, resists taking uh, an electric guitar and singing for an hour instead of 10 hours. There's still this sort of association between the ghosts and the and artistic kind of uh, achievement. So. It's interesting that there's change and uh, the real sort of point, I mean, the really interesting bit of the tradition for me is still there. Um, as an anthropologist, of course, you can't but like exoticism and archaic stuff. So 
you're disappointed when these beautiful instruments get replaced by electric guitars that you can buy for $100 uh, here. So, uh, but that's not, you know, that's just my, you know, uh, it's a kind of colonial idea of people. Uh, so, um, no, these things are, are, are changing and, uh, um, and at the same time, if one wanted to uh, do a study, that would be the perfect time, this would be the perfect time to do that because um, underneath all these sort of surface ch changes, there's lots and lots of um, very interesting sort of commonalities. Well, thank you for an engaging and even amusing talk. I very much appreciate it. And I'm curious about going back to your, your prior slide, your, your main take home point that collective memory is metaphysical, that it's mm. uh, metaphorical, that it metaphorical, does not yeah. exist. Yes. And since we all came for an eight or 10 hour session of entertainment yeah. here, <laughs> I'm curious if you'd care to engage on Jung's thought of collective consciousness. Yes. There is some archetypical <laughs> lover, warrior, magician, sure. king, archetypes coming yeah. across all cultures. I think so, and, and, and I think, I mean, that's one of the things I study. Um, however, I think we, we sort of um, err in a way if we think that because there are those common themes which do uh, recur, because there are those themes, we have to think of them as the thoughts of some sort of collective uh, entity. Um, and of course, it, it's, there is, I mean, for any social scientist, there's a sort of more re reductionist or uh, uh, picture that is more appealing, which is that, well, that is just the similarity, similarity sorry, that you will encounter if you have lots of brains that are made with the same design uh, and faced with lots of cultural input. Um, so in that sense, the, the fact that there are um, um, similar themes like that would be more product product of the, the resemblance or the similarities between uh, human minds uh, and brains than it is um, the product of a common mind. But it's and it's true that there are extraordinary resemblances. I mean, the, the um, if you find the story of Cinderella uh, amusing, you can go to China and there's a Chinese Cinderella. You can go to the deepest of Africa and you'll find African Cinderella stories. They're not quite the same, but they have the same, uh, you know, uh, stepfather, um, stepmother situation and so on and so forth. This is something that keeps coming back. Now, also you'll have um, narrative structures like the hero who is the most challenged person, like, you know, the tiniest guy uh, in the tribe, but he's very tough and manages to become the super uh, king or and very often for, for example something that seems complicated but is actually found in so many different cultures all over the world is the parallel fates of two heroes one who's very high and will go very low because he makes all the wrong choices or does the bad things and the very low who becomes the very high because he makes all the right choices you find that in lots of folk tales in epics and things like that but i think this is more evidence for the fact that we are very much the same people uh, from the same species. Um, so I, I would tend to, to try and avoid these sort of uh, constructions. I'm wondering what you think, uh, what you might think of some of these contemporary modern, uh, contemporary animated movies that the kids are watching or that they're <laughs> making for the kids, where the, you know, the same elements are in them, but they can go off the charts with with some of their thoughts. Uh, right. So I'm. I'm not a consumer of that kind of thing, so uh, <laughs> it's difficult for me to uh, to comment. But uh, I think the um, uh, yes, I'm always surprised when I see, especially the the Japanese versions of these things, that um, for me they're incredibly concise and go incredibly fast. That is, um, you know, a hero is faced with something, says two words, 
the image changes, we're in a different place, and that's once he's decided to do something about that situation and he's doing it. And uh, children follow that without any problem. I think adults would have a bit more resistance because they're more used to a narrative tempo that is uh, more moderate. Uh, but it seems to me that, that um, these things are more extreme because uh, the, the, the uh, you know because th they're, they're they're made for children and uh, you know I used to do experiments with children and I know that if you don't do something interesting every w every minute you lose them uh, and if they're three year olds it's every ten seconds so y you know so you have this sort of very so maybe that explains this exaggeration of those weird physics and stuff like that uh, but there are bits of um, yes and and and. Um, also, uh, the children are less um, interested in consistency in character, for example, but much more interested in consistency in um, physics. So someone who has a particular power will have that particular power, and that's very clear, and that's useful. Um, whereas the, and, uh, when you get so, some, s some very talented people manage to produce things that get these two audiences at the same time, like the, um, that animation movie, The Incredible or uh, Irresistible, or I, I don't know, the whole family where the mother, for example, can stretch incredibly, and you know. The, the, so you have this thing where the adults are taken, are sort of caught by the interesting characters, and the, the kids are, are taken in by the, all the physics, um, and everyone's happy about that. The, the vet is very much more for, uh, is very much a, a, a sort of a, another example of that. Uh, there is some, some all sorts of um, weird fantasy that is kind of fun. Uh, you know, the idea of compressing your family and putting it uh, up your nose. <laughs> it, it doesn't, it's not one of those mythological things that have very, that have lots of profundity to them, but it's a fun idea. Uh, but then you have all these serious stuff that I mentioned. So, yeah, I don't know. I think those dynamics work in lots of human cultures. Yeah, so um, if I think about sitting down and listening to eight or ten hours of a story, <laughs> that strikes me as have a, a culture that has a lot of leisure time. <laughs> if, if I was going to sit down and watch ten hours of the great British baking show, you know, it's that's, that's a very extravagant <laughs> use of time. And it comes to a sense of... In my mind, it comes to, with all that leisure time, you're a rich culture. Um, I, I mean, yeah. it's almost rich in terms of economic value. Yeah. How, how do you... Well, I, I don't think it's... Uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't you know, want to portray the, a, a picture of those people doing that every day. Uh, these are quite exceptional events. No, no I think it's... Um, in you know, in a village that has no um, other sources of information, no media or stuff like that, this is the, the, the way people have fun. So every, you know, maybe three, four, five times a year, people will have a session like that, which I think is pretty moderate compared to TV binging that uh, many of us <laughs> would engage in. Um, but it's true that there's a connection between uh, leisure and culture that is, uh, that is interesting. So, for example, I showed you the village where the men congregate, and the idea is that the men congregate there because there could be war with other villages, so they have to be together ready. I mean, that's the official reason why that is a, a special house for the men. But the men are just <laughs> gossiping. And they're not, you know, there haven't been tribal wars for like a century. And they, they so they gossip. They weave baskets and they gossip. And, um, but that gossip is not just, so, you know, in a small village, the gossip is quickly exhausted, you know, that oh, so-and-so has new shoes or something like that. And, you know, people discuss, you know, did you see them? No, I didn't. Well, they were there. So, but after a while, you know, it sort of uh, peters out. And then people talk about um, all sorts of m uh, rich, thick, cultural sort of things, like, you know, uh, obviously a sort of central theme uh, of these discussions will be why are men, uh, why are women not like men? 
which I heard like you know for hours on end for <laughs> weeks on end. And but through this, you get all sorts of you know interesting cultural models being transmitted about what's expected from people, what is change, what is cultural change, what is good, what is bad, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of um, profound or, or 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 deep leisure in a way in these kinds of encounters all right thank you, thank you. join me in thanking pascal for a wonderful talk thank you pascal